And what ended up happening is that there was like about a year, year and a half where I became really rebellious, really rebellious and disrespectful to my mom. Um, I would be in fights constantly, numerous detentions, even suspension. And I know that my mom just didn't know what to do with me, right? She didn't know how to get me out of this rebellious stage in my life. My family would always put Radio Vision Cristiana, this Christian radio station in the New York metro area. It was a 24 seven radio station. They would have a lot of songs, a lot of preachings. And that night, I believe it was every weekend night, they would put on Gigi Avila, this well-known um, evangelist that evangelized like all Latin America. He was very like fire and brimstone type of preacher. Like, if you don't repent, you're going to hell. If you don't repent, you're going to hell. That night I was like, ah, I do not want to go to hell. If something happens to me tonight, I don't want to end up in hell. I remember going to my room and just falling on my knees and just, just surrendering it all. I was born into a broken home, um, a lot of brokenness in my home. Um, my, the neighborhood I grew up in was not the prettiest neighborhood, to say the least. Um, shootings were common. Um, addiction was very common. Um, pe seeing people strung out in front of my building, on the stair in the staircase of my building was very common. Um, prostitution, very common. Um, gang violence, very common as well. All of these things was very common in my neighborhood. Um, the neighborhood I grew up in was made infamous by a couple couple rappers that come out of, out of that neighborhood and, and a heavyweight champion. So Jay-Z, Biggie Smalls, Mike Tyson, they all come from my neighborhood. And Mike Tyson eventually left my neighborhood to a bordering neighborhood. That's even worse. Um, so that's the type of environment I, I grew up in. I grew up next door to the projects, not in the projects, but next door to the projects in a trap. So a trap, for those of you that don't know what that is, is a building dedicated to the selling and distribution of narcotics. The two biggest narcotics that I was aware of that they sold in my building were crack, crack cocaine, and heroin. And the re reason why I knew that is because I would see the crack bottles um, throughout the hallways, um, the syringes in the garbage can. My father was the super of the building I grew up in. So a lot of times he'd tell me to take out the trash and I would just see the loads and loads of, of syringes to the point where I was always afraid that it would get pricked by by a syringe. Remember even having nightmares a lot of times growing up that that I would be like forced to use drugs. Wow. Um and specifically through a through a syringe. Did so, your did your parents ever um as even your dad being the super, like did he ever warn you about these things or talk to you about these things? About being careful to not get pricked? Yes, mm -hmm. definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. Because I had to take out the, the trash. I, I as a good son, mm -hmm. you know, your dad gives you shores. So yeah, he definitely always told me to be careful with that. Um, so that's the environment I really grew up in. By the time I was in kindergarten, at the age of five or so, I ended up getting sexually abused in school. Um, what ended up happening during that time, my kindergarten teacher was very sick, and I believe she died from cancer, if I'm not mistaken. So basically that whole school year, we had substitute teachers throughout the school year. And a lot of times when they wouldn't find enough substitute teachers, if a teacher was out, they would split up those classes into other classes. And that day, I believe it was a fifth or sixth grader, my school went up to the sixth grade, the elementary school I went to, that class was split up and generally was in, two, in, in groups of two, in two different classrooms. That class of 20, 30 students would be split up throughout the school. Um, my class got this one kid and that kid ended up sexually abusing me in the restroom, the little kindergarten restroom within the classroom. Um, and whether I realized it or not, that ended up opening doors in my life later on. And, and, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, when that actually happened, I, I, I was confused. I didn't know really what happened. I kind of like rushed out of the restroom because obviously as a little kid, I was scared. The kid was older than me, five, six years older than me. So I didn't know what just happened, but I knew later on in life that that awakened, it, it, it awoke something within me. During that time, my family was a very devout Catholic family. And when I say devout, it was the type of Catholics that would go to church or mass just once a year during Easter. This time, my family decided to go to mass on Easter when they decided to go. For some reason, um, the temple, the, the church was closed. Um, and my mom or my dad told my mom, why don't we go to that crazy church, that crazy church, the one that your brother goes to? 
La Iglesia de los Locos, the Church of the Crazy Folks, right? And what he meant by that was a stereotypical Pentecostal church that moved in, in the gifts of the Spirit, moves in and um, believed in speaking in tongues and dancing in the Spirit, all of these type of types of things. And they decided and ended up going to church to the other side of Brooklyn to go visit my uncle's uncle's church. And that was the beginning of of God starting the work in my family. It didn't happen overnight. I'm not going to lie and say that they went to that one service after skipping Mass or missing Mass, and, and their whole life completely changed. It was a process. It took a couple years. But by the time I was about seven years old, that's when my family decided to be, my parents decided to be loyal members of that, of that church that we went to um, or that we started going to. And I started seeing the change in my family's life. It was something beautiful, something wonderful from a family that stereotypical, um, worldly young family um, having house parties. My dad had a drinking problem during that stage of his life. My parents weren't married at that point in their life either. So um, a lot of brokenness in our home and other things as well. But at that stage, again, everything started changing. My, my parents got married. They, they made it official, they got married. We were the poor kids in the hood basically. When other kids were wearing J's and, and nice name brand clothing, we were the ones with the Payless shoes or or, shoe, or clothing that they handed us down, gave to us. We were the poor kids in the hood. And we thought we were poor until we came to Jesus and we realized that, that we even got poorer, I guess you would say, to a certain extent. What ended up happening is that, like in a lot of families in, in the inner city, if you stay in the same job, a lot of times you get your little pay, um, pay bumps, 25 cents more an hour or whatever it may be. And a lot of people tend to make money under the table, not report everything, right, in order to keep their benefits, their government benefits. Right. Um, my family felt conviction about that, um, and they started reporting everything. And then we lost all of our government benefits. So at that point, when we thought we were poor, we we're now even more poor. Um, and I remember there was a point in my life at a really young age that we, we didn't even have, the fridge was empty. There was no car. We didn't have bus fare tokens. It was tokens back then before Metro Cards in New York. We didn't have money for the token to get on the train or the bus to go to a church on the other side of Brooklyn. For a while, we couldn't go to church just because we didn't have a way to get there. The church bus wouldn't go to that, that far, at least, um, to pick up members. And I remember one day, just randomly, the pastor of that church at that time was a super anointed man of God, um, Raul Otero, and he ended up bringing a, a caravan, but not a caravan, but basically brought a group of people to bring us groceries. I remember there was big old sacks of grocery, and I believe it was from Costco. And out of nowhere, where people just started bringing us up loads and loads of groceries. Um, and it was just such a beautiful thing. Yeah. Seeing that God is a God that provides, you know, Jehovah Jireh. Mm. And that touches me because it just reminds me of the heart God is giving me for the people that don't have nothing, the forgotten. Yeah. And there's been points in my life that God has put people in my heart and I've brought groceries to their doorstep. I've gone to random cities, um, <laughs> usually forgotten cities to bring people groceries because there's people that have gone through the same things as me. And during that same time, um, I was, my family was getting changed. Things were changing in my family's life, but still I hadn't come to the feet of Jesus as of yet. Obviously I was really young, <laughs> um, but I still didn't come to the feet of Jesus. I was forced to go to church whenever my family would go to church on Sundays and Friday nights, they had Friday night services. So I would be forced to go to church. Um, and what ended up happening is that there was like about a year, year and a half where I became really rebellious, really rebellious and disrespectful to my mom. Um, I would be in fights constantly, numerous detentions, even suspension. I'm sure I was to the point of getting kicked out of the school that I went to. Um, and I know that my mom, just didn't know what to do with me, right? She didn't know how to get me out of this rebellious stage in my life. And what ended up happening is that I felt like I needed protection from other crews um, in the school I went to, from other crews in the neighborhood I grew up in. And I ended up getting jumped into a crew. And that wasn't the only time I got jumped. I got jumped multiple times after that. Um, I got involved in, in tagging. If you don't know what tagging is, is graffiti. 
and my tag name was Chaos. And recently I know the Lord revealed to me that, that I had to renounce um, those word curses that I pronounced upon my own life. Um, every time that I would tag chaos on a wall, tag chaos on a, on a bathroom stall or whatever it was, the Lord revealed to me that he, that, that I was pronouncing a curse over my own life. And I had to renounce that actually fairly recently, um, chaos over my life. And the truth is, truth is that my life was chaotic in that point in my life. Um, I started doing things with females that an 11 year old shouldn't be doing. Generally, you hear people getting more involved in that type of thing. Um, in their teenage years, I was doing things at the age of 11 years old, feeling up on females, and then also doing other things in the classrooms, in school, in the hallways, as I was growing up as, at the age of 11. As well, that same year, at the age of 11 years old, I ended up getting cut in school just because of my rebellion, just because of the things I was involved in. And, and by cut, just to clarify, what exactly do you mean? They cut me in my face in school. Oh. They cut me in my face. And that's another testimony in itself because it's almost invisible. Mm. It's the Lord, the Lord only. Because when it happened, I was in a rebellious stage. I thought it was going to be look cool. I thought it was going to look bad, all that type of thing. I remember at that point in my life, there was two big things that really impacted me. Two, really, two big things that, that shook me up. That shook me up in that point in my life. When I got cut, my mom tells me that the principal called her and said, you need, to get, you need to get the authorities involved. You need to call the cops. And my mom called the cops. The cops showed up to the school. Um, they took the kid down to the precinct. And they ended up showing him the, some of the holding cells, right? Some of the holding cells that they had within the precinct. We had to go down there as well. My mom had to fill out some, some paperwork, right? And I remember that at that moment, that kind of like shook me up that I shouldn't be in that place at that point in my life, 11 years old in a precinct because I just had been been cut in school. That was something that shook me up, shook me up. It was a different point of view. I was in the cutter, I was a cutty, right? But it, it kind of shook me. And the second thing is, I remember, I believe it was a Saturday. I was in the living room of the apartment we grew up in and my mom's bedroom was right next to it. And what ended up happening was that the door was like halfway open. I remember, I remember even the sun coming in through the, through the curtains of the window. And I remember seeing my mom just there praying, praying. And I can't remember if I, I heard the wo words coming out of her mouth. I don't believe I did. But something deep down inside of me knew that I knew <laughs> that I knew that she was praying for me. I knew that I knew that I knew that she was praying for me. And she didn't know what to do with me in that point in my life. She, she tried the, 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 the hard hand, right? She tried to make sure that, that we wouldn't hang out in the neighborhood that we, we grew up in. And, and I rarely even remember hanging out in the neighborhood I grew up in. She would always take us to the other side of Brooklyn, to Sunset Park, the, the nicer side of Brooklyn. And still, I got involved in things I should not have gotten involved in. But I knew that I knew she, she was praying for me, that she was praying to the only person that could change her rebellious son in that stage of his life. And it was just something beautiful. It was just something wonderful. And I know those prayers ended up, made it up to heaven. It, it just shook me. It, it, it resounding, resounded to like the deepest parts of my soul that she cared enough for me that she would pray for me. And what ended up happening is that the principal of the school, that was the transition stage in my life where I was supposed to go from junior, uh, from elementary school to junior high. So from sixth to seventh grade, again, my elementary went up to sixth grade at that point in time. And I was supposed to go to the same zone school as all the people that I hung out with. And my mom was trying to make sure that I didn't hang out with those kids anymore. And the principal said, hey, so you could put them in a disciplinary school, a school for kids that have, um, disciplinary problems, right? Problematic kids to a certain extent. My mom saw the best in me and she didn't see me. She didn't want to put me in that type of school. So my mom refused that idea. She, she rejected that idea. Principal told her, well, there's another option. I could put you down as though you live in a different address. <laughs> Something that technically is not right, probably ethically not right either. But my mom was at her end, right? And she wanted to do whatever possible to ensure that I didn't go to that school. That school had the cops there constantly as well. But the biggest thing was the group that I was in. She wanted to ensure that I wasn't around them anymore. 
and to a certain extent, I was still re really, really respectful. Like I, I wasn't a kid that that would just escape from my house, right? And there was one door. I was, maybe I could have escaped from a fire escape or something. But life is a little different in New York. There's not many back doors to run run out of. But that time in my life was was again a very chaotic time. And I know that the Lord used my mom more than changing me from schools, making sure that I didn't go to the same school, that I wasn't around those same kids. More than anything else, I know it was the prayers of my mom. I know it was the prayers of my mom. Um, so I ended up going to the other school. It wasn't the best school either. Um, surrounded by projects, um, things, crazy things happened at school too, but that's a separate thing. Um, at the age of 12, I remember, so not long after, um, at that point in my life, again, my family was different. My family would always put Radio Vision Cristiana, this Christian radio station in the New York metro area that's actually headquartered in, in Patterson, New Jersey. They would always have the radio station on. It was 24-7 radio station. They would have a lot of songs, a lot of preachings. And that night, I believe it was every weekend night, they would put on Gigi Avila, this well-known um, evangelist that evangelized like all Latin America. He was very like fire and brimstone type of preacher. Like, if you don't repent, you're going to hell. If you don't repent, you're going to hell. And especially nowadays, a lot of people speak against that type of preaching. And like, you're not supposed to scare people into, into salvation, basically, but it worked for me. And that night, that night I was like, ah, I do not want to go to hell. If something happens to me tonight, I don't want to end up in hell. And yeah, that's how I came to Jesus. I, I remember going to my room and just falling on my knees and just just surrendering it all to Jesus um, at the age of 12 years old, where a lot of kids were still playing with little Nerf guns and, and playing with other little toys. I was already <laughs> the year before involved in things that a 11 year old shouldn't be involved in. Um, and I've never liked guns because of the environment I grew up in, even toy guns. Um, but yeah, God just completely changed me. I. I began studying the word, just digging into the word deeply. I remember praying, fasting. I would be the the, the teenage kid in church with the 50-something year olds, the 80-something year olds for the all day Sunday fast. I would be that that one kid in church with the 50-something year olds. I learned to pray from my mom, but also from this 80-something year old in our church. I remember that, that the toes of his shoes would wear out before the soles of his shoes because that's how much time he'd spend in prayer. I just became madly in love with Jesus. In, in Jeremiah 20, it says that, I like the way it says in the Spanish, me seduciste y pudiste más que yo. In English, you would translate that as like, you seduced me. But if you read it in NIV, I believe it says that you've persuaded me. <laughs> but I like the word seduce because it's like more intimate. Um, and that's literally what the Lord did. Like throughout my life, I won't say I was perfect from there on. I made mistakes. I, I went to places I should not have gone to. I, I went to clubs. I went to different things just to kind of like try it. But the Lord would always persuade me. He would always seduce me and pull me back in. And it was just a, a beautiful and wonderful thing that the Lord had done. And and David, how mm -hmm. if if you could just kind of bring to a uh, bring us into that moment a little bit of how would you feel God seducing you, persuading you, pulling you in? I remember one time I was in in Indiana, literally, and we were going to like this little party at a school. I was an intern at that time in my life. And as was I was walking from the car out, the car that took us there, into the party, to, to, to the little area where they were partying, I remember the Holy Spirit, you're not supposed to be here. You're not supposed to be here. Where are you going? And I remember just fumbling over my own feet and I fell just walking <laughs> to the party. And I knew it was the Holy Spirit convicting me. And anytime I would go to places like that, there would always be temptation with, with women. I remember going to that party, me being in the corner trying to be a good Christian in a party, and girls coming to me, and me getting temptation, knowing that I shouldn't be there in the first place, but and then the Lord or the enemy, not really the Lord, the enemy trying to just put something on my lap, basically. Mm -hmm. So I knew every time I would go to one of those places, I knew that I shouldn't have been there. I shouldn't have been there. So the Lord would always be seducing me, pulling me in. <laughs> At the age of 13, I remember going to a Friday night service. They had Friday night services at the church I went to. I remember going up for the altar call and 
the Lord used this man in our church to give me a word. It was a private word. It wasn't a big um, public word like they do a lot of times in churches and they do it from the mic and all that. Um, it wasn't that type of word. It was a private word to my ear. And he was like, the Lord wants to use you. The Lord wants to use you now. And that's all I remember. And the word may have been that simple. The Lord wants to use you and the Lord wants to use you now. I remember going back to my pew because it was pews back then, doubting every word that came out of that man's mouth, not knowing that the Lord was using that man. Doubting every word in my mind, thinking, how can the Lord use me? I'm from the wrong side of the tracks. I'm too young. I don't even technically, I feel like I don't belong here in this church. I remember five, at most 10 minutes later, the Lord used the pastor's wife, Jackie Otero. And I remember she's one of the reasons why I fell in love with preaching. She used to be such a fiery, passionate preacher, I remember. And she wasn't part of that first word again. It was a private word, that first word. She calls me out, tells me to go to the altar. Again, it was another private word. She says, you doubt that the Lord could use you? Mm. I was like, like, whoa. Oh my gosh, I was just so amazed. I was like, what? Like, I didn't pronounce a word. I didn't mumble a word. It was all thoughts that had run in my mind wow. just a couple minutes ago. And she read my mind like it was a letter. And I had been marked by God and Jesus, right? I accepted Jesus in my life when I was 12. And that was a marking and a seal, you know? But in that moment, I was like, the marking and the seal of the Holy Spirit. He just marked me. Yeah, now in, in the era that we live in, that there's so much debate about <laughs> gifts of the Spirit, um, deliverance, whether deliverance is for the believer or not. I remember that moment in my life, see, thinking of so many things that I had gone through, hearing things in the hallway where I grew up in, knowing that I would hear demons in the, in the building I would grow up in, that mm. I grew up in. Remember seeing a, a man that they called Culebra, people have nicknames in the hood um him taking out his tongue and his tongue literally looking like a snake and a dog there used to be a lot of straight dogs back in new york back in those days that dog taking out his tongue as well and looking like the, the tongue of a snake i remember that that moment in my life just kind of confirmed that everything that i had lived all the demonic attacks that the spiritual world was real and that above everything else the Holy Spirit and Jesus had overcome the world, had overcome all darkness. And the way that Jesus, the way that God had used this woman through the Holy Spirit to read my thoughts just blew my mind. Wow. And it made me fall even more in love with Jesus, if that's even possible. I just fell more in love with Jesus. And that, that was kind of like the beginning and the stamp, I would say, of the Holy Spirit for me for my future years where, where I would start preaching in school where, where I would be the, the one Christian kid that would bring his big <laughs> New King James Bible to school to prove, hey, this is what the Word says about that. This is what the Word says about this. <laughs> so I, I remember that was like that moment of that stamp of approval, that, 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 that marking that the Holy Spirit um, put on my life when he, when he used that woman, the pastor's wife, to give me a word of knowledge. It, it was just remarkable. Even to this day, like, it, it feels like it was yesterday that it happened that I was 13 years old. So, um, yeah, that, that leads me into my high school years. Um, I remember then um, in New York, they have something called the Youth Employment Program where they provide um, youth um, employment during the summertime, starting at the age of 14. So it was either my first or second job. I was 14 or 15. I was working at, at the criminal court in Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn. And I, I, I was in charge of um, doing the arraignment paperwork for people as they went before the judge. And in that time, it was a manual process. Now I'm sure it's all by computers. But I would like put stickers on paper and get all the paperwork ready. And um, I would get to see briefly like some cases. And I remember one case came across my desk and the name looked oddly familiar, oddly familiar. And the name it was the name of that kid that had cut me a couple years earlier. And I remember the the Holy Spirit just came upon me and just showed me that that could have been me. That, yes, yeah, started really young. It could have been something simple to some, right, compared to other things that were going on in my neighborhood. But it looked like he had continued going down the wrong path. And the Lord had come to my life and had changed my life completely. I was doing the arraignment paperwork at that court. 
And, and I remember feeling so thankful to the Lord, feeling so thankful that he had rescued me, mm. that he had rescued me. Um, and again, high school years were wonderful. I, I was the, the preacher kid <laughs> in school. I was the kid that, that, that didn't necessarily fit in, but everyone knew <laughs> because I was the guy that was different. I was the guy that would preach the word. And I remember at the, during my senior year, I was 17. At that point in my life, we had moved from the hood and God <laughs> moved us to the neighborhood I dreamed of living in. I literally remember as a kid dreaming of living in that side of, of Brooklyn, Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Um, and the Lord made it even better. The neighborhood next to Sunset Park called Bay Ridge, we moved to Bay Ridge. Um, and Bay Ridge, some people don't even consider part of Brooklyn. It's that nice. It's that nice. And God moved us to that side of Brooklyn the, the summer before my senior year. And I remember that senior, that senior year, I was always a very physical defender. Um, playing basketball. We were playing basketball in gym, and I was locking this guy down. Like, he couldn't score on me. He couldn't score on me, and, and, and I took pride in being able to lock someone down. Um, and he got offended. He didn't like it um, to the point where he, he snuffed me. Snuff is a very New York term, generally like a way to punk someone with your fist. You kind of like do, push their face. But th in this case, he did it with an open hand, and he pushed my face. And I remember that really got me mad, right? He got me mad and, and I grabbed him and I shook him up and we we're about to get into a fight. They broke us up and almost immediately a, a friend that I had back in those days came to me and he said, hey, aren't you a Christian? And you were going to fight? Aren't you a Christian? And I remember my heart like sunk to my stomach because I felt like I didn't represent Jesus in that moment in time. Um, obviously, I'm human too, right? We get angry, but I felt like I could have managed that a little bit better. So, and then the gym, the, the, the play time or play period of the gym period ended, and um, we went down to the locker rooms. Generally, the locker rooms had security to ensure um, kids didn't do anything stupid. In that moment in time, there was no no security f for some reason that day. Kid came looking for me, and fight broke out fight broke out. And I knew in that moment in time that I had to represent Jesus. The, the Holy Spirit let me know that I couldn't fight back. And I'm not going to lie, I did throw one, one punch and I felt conviction for that. Um, but what I did was put myself in my, my best defensive position and just let the guy pound on me until he got tired. He literally kept pounding on me, pounding on me, pounding on me until he got tired of pounding on me. And what ended up happening a week, two weeks later, as, as I was entering the school, about to go through the metal detectors to get into the school, guess who was there by the metal detectors? Just outside the metal detectors in crutches was that kid that I had gotten into a fight with. And again, the Holy Spirit came upon me and he let me know, see, I fight your battles. I defend you better than you could ever defend yourself. And he had, I think, fractured his ankle or broke his ankle, something, but he was in crutches. And the Holy Spirit let me know, even though that was a really humbling moment where I had to let this guy beat me up, literally. Jesus got beat up for us, but that's another story, right? So at that moment, I knew that I had to represent Jesus and the Lord let me know that he was the one that fights my battles. And from there, I ended up going to college, typical story. Now. I've been in Jesus. I, I ended up moving around quite a bit. Thanks and glory to honor to God and, or, and honor to God. Um, he has taken me to places that I never thought I would go. Um, I've been able to go and evangelize in places that I never thought I would be able to go and evangelize. Um, I married a beautiful woman. Um, I have two beautiful and wonderful kids. She has a heart for, for the soul. She has a heart for the forgotten, just like I do. Some people are, don't are not daring enough to go into the hood and say, I will never go back to the hood. But there's a lot of forgotten people in the hood. And, and that's something that the Lord has put, not just in my heart, but my wife's heart. She comes from a little bit different background, but she, more of a suburban background, but she also has also showed me that even in the suburbs, there's a lot of brokenness. Yeah. Um, so the Lord has brought us together. I won't say that it's been perfect. I won't say that things didn't go wrong because it was very rocky. It's been very rocky in the early stages of our marriage. God has mended a lot of things, corrected a lot of things, and brought us back together. Um, but that's a testimony for itself. And God, all I could say is that God has been good in a nutshell. Now I, I work 
on a project that's going to take us back to the moon. As an engineer, we are designing this. Um, who would have thought a kid from the from the hood would be working on such a project? I've honestly even been scared of talking about these type of things because I don't want people to know <laughs> at my work about my background. But God has just been more than good, more than good. Wow. David, you, uh, you you spoke about your parents um, at the beginning of your testimony. How, how is your relationship um, with them today? So my relationship is really really good with my, with my family right now. Um, God had to mend a lot of things, especially between me and my dad. There was a stage in my life where I, I held a lot of resentment against my father um, for family secrets, for, for things that I found out right before I originally left New York. But God definitely had bended it. Um, in that stage of my life, I remember uncover, uncovering a secret where my dad was um, was being unfaithful, right, to my mom. And I remember carrying that burden, that secret upon my shoulders as I originally left New York for some internships that I did during college. It was very hard, to say the least. It, it was a burden that I felt like I shouldn't have, shouldn't have to carry. Right? I felt like if I would have revealed that secret, that I could could have destroyed my family. And I remember when I told my mom, my mother said that she knew. She knew, right? And then she told me that I had to confront my dad. Before I even told my mom, I remember there was a couple of days where I, I would just go to my room and, and cry, and grunt, as the Word of God says, right? That God understands our even our grunts. Um, but told my mom, my mom told me to confront my dad, confronted my dad. I remember having such feelings of bitterness, hate, hurt, this mixed bag of emotions against my dad um, to the point when I confronted him. I was working at the same factory as him during that time, um, during my college days. I remember clocking out, sped off in his um, 83 Corolla. I love that little Corolla. Um, then about two blocks up, I just felt like I had to come back came back, uh, went back into the factory, confronted him. I remember even seeing a weapon, like this thing that could have been used as a weapon, and thoughts came to my head of using that to hurt my dad. I rebuked that in the name of Jesus. Um, those thoughts definitely were not from God, but it was a really painful and hurtful time in my life. Then I, I went off to Indiana a couple months later. That was literally the summer before I started my internship in September of that same year. So it was just a couple months from each other. I remember being in Indiana and being in my little apartment, and I remember watching Fireproof. It's a powerful movie about um, about God healing a marriage, right? But not only was he healing a marriage, but he was also healing a relationship between a, fa a, a mother and a son. And this son had this resentment against his mother, and I I related to that. I I I knew what that felt like. And I remember I, I even paused the movie because it brought such conviction to my life that that I had to call my dad. I had to call my dad. I called my dad. I was like, hey, dad, I'm sorry. I had all these feelings against you. I had all this resentment against you. Um, I just, just sorry. And um, he asked me for forgiveness. And that that's where God started to mend the relationship between my dad and me, because the honest truth, my dad was my hero, right? I knew my dad before Christ and, and how he was before Christ. But but after Christ, he was a totally different man. He worked normally 60 hours a week. And after getting off of work, he was the super of the building. So his soup, being a super wasn't his primary job. That was his secondary job. And he would still make sure that the building was standing correctly. He would patch up the hole in the living room floor after a crackhead went through the living room floor to, to, to rob us. He, he, he did it all. Electrical, plumbing. He knew mechanical work. He, he, he just did it all. And I just wanted to be like my dad. Like, how do you know how to do so much? Mm -hmm. And that kind of tainted that moment in my life, tainted that image that I had of my dad, right? He was, again, my Superman. And I remember... I remember even my vows... My, It's okay. I remember when I got married with my wife, beautiful day. <laughs> I 
I spoke a little bit about my family in, in, during my, my vows. And I was like, to the, uh, this, I, I remember saying something like, this kid that comes from the hood, from the same neighborhood as Busta Rhymes and Biggie and, and Jay-Z. Um, and I love my dad, who used to be and still is my superhero. And I, I know maybe to a lot of people that didn't know my story, it, it didn't mean nothing to them, right? But for me, like, it meant the world. My dad was there. Um, my dad and my mom were still together. Um, that secret that I had to reveal didn't destroy my family. It didn't destroy my family. Instead, I believe it made my family stronger. It was a rough period. Um, and in, in Spanish, there's this show that says, Hasta la mejores familias, even in the best families, right? Jesus had transformed our lives, but that there was that rough patch, that, that secret, that skeleton in the closet, like they say, that had to be revealed in order for, for the brokenness to be healed. Wow. And God healed me, healed the relationship with my dad. Now to this day, when I need to learn, need to fix something in my house, something electrical, something in the plumbing, something goes wrong in my car. I, I'm sure I probably annoy him sometimes because <laughs> I contact him about all these things, but I have somebody I could go to um, and ask him about pretty much anything. And he just knows how to do it all. He's, he's still my superhero. Mm. Uh, David, you experienced sexual abuse, sexual abuse at an early age. How did God deal with that in your life after? How was he able to um, heal you from that hurt or from that moment that you experienced as a child? I would say that was, uh, that was a point in my life that I really suppressed to the point that I remember mentioning it to my mom, but I must have mentioned this so briefly that she even had forgotten. Because I know a few years ago, I mentioned it to my mom again, and she was like, kind of like surprised about it. I was like, but mom, I told you. And she was like, I'll find the kid. Even to this day, I'll find them, and this and that. But really, it was something that kind of like I pushed into the background. And it was I know it was something that triggered some of the things that I was doing with females at the age of 10, 11 years old, to the point that I knew the Lord had to heal me from it when I converted. I remember when I converted, not long after, going to my mother's room and just bawling, just crying, like, Mom, I did this, I did that. Um, I did this to a female, even though everything was consensual and she was actually a little older than me, like a year older than me, I felt conviction from the Holy Spirit because an 11, 12 year old shouldn't be doing those types of things. And I remember going, it was phone books back then, going to my phone book, trying to find her number, search for her number, call it up. She was not at that number anymore. She had, she had moved, called a couple other people, trying to find her to ask her for forgiveness. I felt that convicted from some of the sexual things I had done, even with her, that I felt like I had to ask her for forgiveness. I never found her, um, but I know that through that process, the Lord was healing me. Was the Lord was healing me from the sexual abuse, healing me from some of the se very sexual things that I did with females at, at that really, really young age. Yeah. Could you say that that's something that he still even working out inside of you as far as, because uh, a lot of the time, even child and child abuse, you know, there's not a space for us to talk about it so much. Have you gotten that space to, to really even process that with the Lord? Is that something that you're still kind of processing and, and allowing Him to kind of take you deep in? Yeah, I would say as part of even going through this testimony process and and, and um, really going over my life and speaking it over with my wife even, I believe the Lord has gone, has put me through some levels of inner healing. Mm. Even using my wife to help me go through this inner healing process. I do believe that even through this process, God has been healing me from from those scars, from those pains, yeah, from those hurtful moments. Yeah. David, who is Jesus to you? He's my rescuer. He's the one that found that left the 99 to found that to find that one lost sheep. That was me. 
I am that lot, one lost sheep. He found me just in time. So he's my rescuer. David, for anybody who's watching your testimony right now, and it's just identifying with uh, your past and everything that you've been through, what's a word of encouragement that you can give to those who are watching, um, who maybe grew up wanting the Lord and, and even grew up having a relationship with God and maybe feel discouraged um, because they feel like they're left out or, you know, they're the weird kids or, you know, they're not relating with people around them, kind of like how you were when you were a child, right? To those people who are, are seeking this relationship with God and feel left out, what is an encouragement that you can give to those who are watching right now? My, what I could tell you is that you are not forgotten. A lot of times the Lord puts us through a dark period to mold us. A lot of times we go through this stage of darkness because he needs to isolate us. He needs to separate us in order to break off that that is not good. In in the book of Jeremiah, it talks about that that Jeremiah goes down to the house of the of the potter and that he sees this scene he, and he sees the potter at the wheel and the word of God says that that the potter takes off pieces of clay. And if you see the translation of it, um, the pieces of clay that are coming off, they were coming off because they weren't good. They were, they were wasteful. They, were, they didn't belong there. And a lot of times we feel like we're going through brokenness. We are going through brokenness. We feel like we're going through pain because we are going through pain. And we don't understand that the potter is at the wheel taking things away from us, breaking us. Sometimes he has to break the whole the whole um, vase as a whole and just start all over again. And the truth is it's hurtful. The truth is it's painful, but it's all ultimately for your good. It's all ultimately for the, for the glory of God. You are not alone. You are not forgotten. Those are lies of the enemy. If the Lord makes you think like, like sometimes people that, that go through this abandonment or, or feel like the outcast, they become introverted or they become the quiet one. When the Lord, in many cases, never intended you to be introverted, never intended you to be quiet, and the enemy is using this to keep you shut, to stop the prophetic voice <laughs> from coming out. Mm. And there's so many introverts out there, I believe even watching this video, that were never called to be introverted that God never intended you to be quiet, but just because of the struggles and things you've gone through in life, that has shut your mouth. And the spirit of Jezebel, <laughs> spirit of Jezebel is still roaming around this world, trying to shut up and trying to kill prophets. So if you are a person that's introverted, I say there's, there's a good chance that, that there's a prophet in you. There's a prophet in you. Mm. David, any last words for the people who are watching your testimony right now? My last words, despite the things I had gone through, I could proudly say I made it to the altar as a version. Not many people talk about this. I don't talk about it much either because this world tells you that sometimes that you're less of a man if you go, if you know, if you're a virgin, right? I did experiment with certain things, like I said, really young at the age of 11, but Sex, that was until the day that I went into my honeymoon <laughs> with my beautiful wife. So I could proudly say this day with my head held up high that I went to that stage. I went up to that altar. Despite rumors, some people saying that, that we were doing things, I could say, proudly say that we made it to the altar, that I made it to the altar as a virgin. And if there's anyone out there struggling with sexual sin, struggling like, should I just give in? Should I just go out with this girl? Should I just hook up with this girl? Struggling with either doing that or keeping yourself pure before the eyes of the Lord, keep yourself pure. It's worth it. Even if that's the last thing that the world hasn't touched in your life, like me, keep yourself pure because the Lord's going to honor it. The Lord's going to honor it. 